Hello, and welcome to section three, lecture number two of the Marlboro Medieval Studies course on the post-Roman economy. We will cover roughly the sixth century through the eighth, beginning of the ninth century. Next time we'll talk a lot more about the ninth and tenth centuries. Um, today I'll talk a little bit about what happens in the wake of Rome in some in both the East and the West, and some of this is theoretical. We're going to break it up into two halves, roughly. We'll talk some about trade and some about questions of production. Now, obviously, these are related, right? One doesn't have trade without production, but I'm going to break it up into those two because they have very different theoretical questions that attend them. The things that scholars debate about um, have, have particular key points. And we'll start with trade. Now, what you think about Roman trade depends a lot on what you think trade looks like in the Roman Empire. And we talked last time about how the command economy, in which everything was chosen essentially by Rome and Constantinople, both products that were created, how merchants moved around, where those goods ended up, how markets were governed, all of the choices were made by the central government in those instances. But how far you think that penetrated into different areas of the empire, what you think people's relationship to the market was if they lived in, in northern Gaul, in what is now northern France, um, or even England, how you feel like those people related to the broader Mediterranean and Roman economy says a lot about what you think it will look like in this subsequent period. And in particular, it dictates a lot about whether or not we should see this as any sort of a shift or a catastrophe, as we talked about last time. If we think that people in central England are not at all connected to this broader trading economy, then to say that there is no trading economy in the 7th century makes very little difference. They, are, they would be engaged in the same, broadly speaking, the same sets of activities. Now, there, there are several scholarly viewpoints, and I personally see them as sort of three main viewpoints on how we read the centuries, uh, 6th, 7th, and 8th centuries in terms of trade. One of them, and in some ways this is the, the oldest view, this is the view of a number of 19th century historians, um, it's still around, but we'll refer to it as the, the manorial view, which is that after the decline of Rome's centralized economy, essentially everything devolves into the local. And by the time you get the Carolingian, Carolingian Empire in the 8th century, 8th and 9th centuries, that people are producing for themselves. There's very little long-distance trade. Um, everything is controlled by large manors. The nobility and the kings have their large estates that they control. So it is still a very centralized um, set. Well, it's not centralized, but it, it is still a very top-down command structure within the economy itself, but it's on a very small scale. It's, it's a certain number of villages or a, a regional group at most that produces all of their own goods and they rarely see or exchange goods from outside of those groups. This, this system is essentially a glorified system of, of, of subsistence agriculture. Now, the second way to think about this period is as mercantile in, in its sense, that there are traders moving around, but that they are not beholden to anybody. Uh, they are relatively fewer than might have been in Rome, but the collapse of Rome actually opens up market systems, and, and the movement of goods is, well, less than it was in Rome, because, of course, the, the power and monetary control necessary to move around lots of goods has disappeared, that goods in some sense moved where they wanted to go. There was, there was more flexibility and less centralized control. This mercantile view in large part was advanced by, by a, a Viennese professor named um, Dopsch and some of his students, and they claimed to continue to see through the 6th century, 7th century, and into the Carolingian period, areas that were producing largely for market. So while they acknowledge that the end of Rome 
expands the amount of subsistence agriculture being practiced in Europe, that it doesn't end the idea that goods move around and that there are certain people who make their living entirely by producing goods that they will sell to other people, right? Like we saw with pr production of grain in North Africa, there's not a lot of subsistence agriculture or there's at least a significantly less amount of subsistence agriculture and most of what is being produced is for cash that is being sent to Rome. And, and the mercantile view sees this as a continuing feature of the economy. Now, the last and probably the most influential of the ways to view this, and, and so we have the manorial, the subsistence, we have the mercantile, which is that there was flexibility in the absence of centralized control and that you can still see people growing for markets. The last one is usually referred to by its original author, Henri Perren, and, and it's referred to as the Perren thesis. And what Perren postulated is that when when Rome, when politically Rome disappeared, he, he has a sort of dual view. It's not quite a mercantile view, it's not quite a manorial view. And what he says is that when the, poli the political entity of Rome disappeared, the broad trade and exchange across the Mediterranean did not. So in that sense, he sounds mercantilist. But what he then sees is that when Islam appears in the middle of the seventh century and starts taking the southern provinces away from Byzantium, Egypt, and the Middle East, uh, eventually all of North Africa is in Islamic control. What he sees is that, is that that seals the Mediterranean off from trade. There are fewer ships going across it. The Christian-Muslim conflict means that they are unwilling to trade with their neighbors. And so it shuts down the Mediterranean as a viable area of generalized commerce. So people who might have been producing for market in the 6th century, after the political end of Western Rome, um, still producing for ships that were moving around from barbarian kingdom to barbarian kingdom, with the appearance of the Muslims, that all ended. Um, and that's basically the Perenne thesis. He also claims, he, he draws larger conclusions from this, saying that when the Met trade in the Mediterranean ends, there is a shift of view northward, that that people on the northern half of the Mediterranean, so Italy, Rome in this instance, right, but, but France and Spain as well, when they can no longer look to the Mediterranean, and the, the, the Romans referred to, as the, referred to the Mediterranean often as Mare Nostrum, our sea, right, it is, the area, it is the area of complete Roman control. When that is shut off, all of these territories in the north look to the north, and that this in part is why Charlemagne then rises to power, we see control coming out of northern Europe. And Perenne sees this as a fundamental shift when all of the provinces begin to look towards the north for military leadership and political control. And he has a quote where he, I'll, I'll read to you from his book um, called Muhammad and Charlemagne, where he, he states this in a very clear fashion. He says, quote, without Islam, the Frankish empire would have probably never existed, and Charlemagne without Muhammad would be inconceivable. So he sees these as directly related events. And in that sense, he, he also sees some trade continuing in the Carolingian economy, but it is much more restricted, and it is restricted to solely regional market towns, which we'll, we'll talk a little bit about in just a second. In large part, what he's contrasting with are earlier views, particularly people like um, going back all the way to Gibbon, really, Gibbon's decline and fall of the Roman Empire, but other writers in the 19th century. Perenne is writing right at the beginning of the 20th century, I should note, so 100 years ago from when you were listening to this. But they tended to see the political end as synonymous with the economic end. And Perenne basically says, no, no, the economics don't have to stop as long as politics keep, uh, even when politics end. So we have this, this somewhat mercantile view, we have the manorial view, and we have this paren view that, that is particularly opposed to the manorial view, but it is a reworking of the mercantile thesis in some ways. Now, archaeology in the last 50 years has, has put a real shift in how we view the paren thesis. And one of the things that archaeology has done is to 
uh, one of the things that archaeology is really good at, I guess, is when you when you dig up something, you know where you found it, and you know what it is, and it has to have gotten there somehow. So archaeology in the 50s and 60s kept finding ceramics that were made in northern Spain in a, a village in Syria, or Islamic pottery from Egypt in Denmark, um, Islamic coins in Sweden and, and Iceland, as far away as Iceland. And they kept finding sometimes corn, coin hordes, whole collections of Islamic coins throughout Scandinavia, along river routes in central Russia, um, throughout a very wide area in Europe, and correspondingly ceramics made in Europe that were being discovered in North Africa and the Middle East. So what this obviously indicates is that somehow these goods have to have moved between these different places. And the question is, who is carrying them and, and why were they interested in going to those sites? Why, why, what was the exchange that was actually happening? And one of the things that was hard to describe and that scholars were not as clear about, about finding an answer for is, if you are part of the Islamic Caliphate, which is a hugely wealthy body, and you have the capacity to trade with India in the East, um, spices out of India, uh, gold and other goods from all the way over in North Africa, and you can move across this huge amount of space for really a lot of goods that are worth moving around, why would you go to Scandinavia, right? That, that's, that, that was, it may seem like a facetious question, but they, they were asking what were they getting out of Scandinavia? Because it, they knew that they would go to southern Russia along the Black Sea, particularly for wood, um, large trees, which uh, there are places where trees grow in the Middle East, but you get really nice trees for, for shipbuilding and for lumber. In the Black Sea, a little bit further north, you can get um, pine and fir, which grow very tall and very straight, particularly good for ship masts and that sort of thing. So, so there were things that were coming from there, but the scholars had a hard time imagining the the bulk that would have come, that would have driven a larger amount of exchange as the archaeological evidence seemed to be suggesting. Now, at the beginning of the 21st century, just about a decade ago, a new book got written by uh, the, the man who, at least at this point, is the medieval historian at Harvard, Michael McCormick. And McCormick not only compiled all of this archaeological evidence from the past 50 years, he looked at a lot of documentary evidence, he started to look for other types of movement, because the part of the parenthesis is that people simply stopped moving around. Um, so he began to look at letters and, and diplomatic exchanges between different groups, and found that actually the caliphate constantly knew what was going on in France and Germany and Scandinavia. So clearly they were getting news from there, which means that somebody is going between the two to deliver that information. So he starts looking at letters that are written from Christian groups as well, and he finds just an increasingly large body of evidence that people never stop moving around. Sure, when Rome ends as a political body, the unified yearly grain shipments that would go from Egypt to Constantinople, North, uh, Tunisia to Rome, those end. These huge convoys of ships, all with one purpose, might have stopped, but people moving around and people exchanging goods did not. Um, he also provides a really compelling uh, answer and, and solution to what was being traded. It seems like one of the things that Islam was buying a lot of from Europe were slaves. Both Italy and Byzantium in particular were trading, were trafficking in human slaves that they would sell to Islam for the things, all of the things that I mentioned, the spices from the East, gold from Africa, that Islam has that are worth trading with them. And so along with this, once you have some trade established, along with this comes ceramics and coinage and all of the other things that archaeologists have been finding. And it's worth noting that our modern word slave, which comes from Latin sclavus, that word is actually a Byzantine word that they used to refer to the Slavs, right? The people of Central Eastern Europe 
around the Black Sea, people to the north of Byzantium who were not Christian, who Byzantium would capture in large numbers and then sell to Muslim traders in exchange for goods across the Mediterranean. So much of the wealth that is being generated and the trade is on the trafficking of slaves from Central Europe. And in some ways, McCormick's view has now become the standard view, just in a, really in a few short years. And, and part of this is because you have a century of differing views, none of which quite line up and all of which have some evidence. And, and McCormick's new reworking of all of this provides a really compelling picture where there is trade that is happening. There are people moving around. One of the major goods is slaves. But there's also a lot of subsistence agriculture occurring, but especially in Central Europe. It's into this world and into this set of functions that groups like the Vikings appear. And the Vikings, as we mentioned a number of lectures ago, they are at least part trader and part raider. They, they seem to have had places, particularly on, along the Volga River in Russia, where they would meet well-prepared Islamic groups or Byzantine groups and would actually just want to trade. They would have goods that they needed that they knew that they could acquire that way. It was not all acquired through straight-up raiding. And, and it makes sense in this economy in which people are moving around, but you know that there is not one general polity that is going to protect trade. So it blurs the line, especially when one of the main goods being sold is other people who have been captured in battle or raid. It blurs the line between what is larger economic exchange and, and what is goods won in battle. Um, and as we mentioned, this is a line that you see blurred in something like the Epic of Beowulf. Now, this large arc from the Black Sea up the rivers of Russia to the North Sea, Scandinavia, and around to Iceland and Scotland is, is the northern arc of trade. And it's sometimes thought of as the, the northern Mediterranean, that it functions as this integrated trade set. It functions under very different rules than Rome, but the northern arc, like the Mediterranean, both continue to produce lots of human movement and lots of human exchange throughout this period. And, and as I said, that is in many ways the current consensus on how all of this works. Now, before we move to production, I just want to note a couple of things about the Carolingian Empire itself, particularly in the 7th and 8th centuries on the early end under the Merovingians and then under the Carolingians. And those two things are about both uh, the role of towns and about coinage. And one of the questions about towns, there are market towns in this time period, but not many of them become the major trading cities of subsequent centuries. Now, market towns are where, uh, I mentioned before, manorialism has this view, a regionalist view, where people are exchanging, but only with people in their immediate region. And this was still going on, particularly in Western Europe. Um, as I said, France, Germany, the, the what would become the Carolingian Empire. And here, here's a map in case you need reminding. Um, so what role did these towns actually provide? The administrative towns of the empire, places like Aachen in particular, which was Charlemagne's capital, becomes largely irrelevant within two centuries. It is not a place that people go to trade. It is only administrative. So the economic importance of it is, is hard to find. Places like Paris and London, which are not exactly administrative centers, but they are ga regional gathering points, both become major sites later, both economically and politically. Additionally, it's in the 8th and ninth centuries that places like Venice begin to crop up as a area that focuses trade to it and will become very powerful as a trading entity in the late medieval period. Although at this point, um, Venice at least has not risen to what it will be. So we'll talk a little bit more about this next time when we talk about the 10th century and we, we go back over what the economy looks like in the time of the peace and truce of God. But that's one of the questions. As people begin to coalesce into towns, what are the economics that towns attract to them? There are, you can see in some of the primary sources that have been assigned, there are 
um, fairs that happen and there are tolls that get paid when people come to town so that there's enough demand that actually taxes can be raised on the commerce happening. But it is not clear, particularly in the, eight, in the earlier side of this, 7th and 8th centuries, how much the towns are driving commerce and how much they are simply regional centers where people know that they can go to get the extra goods that they are not raising in a purely subsistence way. Because almost nobody, and this is another last little point worth noting, almost nobody is a pure subsistence producer. There's very, very few people in Europe who have everything they need and are 100% autonomous on their little plot of land. They're all integrated into some slightly larger system, even if it means a town of a few hundred families and a market town maybe 10 miles from where they are where they can exchange with five other groups of 100 families. Very small, regionally autonomous, but there's still some movement and some exchange of goods. And the last little point about trade, and then we'll move on to production, is, as I mentioned before, there are Islamic coins discovered all the way along this northern arc. Coinage is something that without a central power to mint it and regulate it, has really fallen off in Western Europe. From really the 7th century onward, you don't have a lot of coins being minted. People are exchanging goods in kind. And we mentioned the, the really even earlier start of that in the 3rd and 4th century last time. Um, it isn't really until the Carolingians, and here you can see Charlemagne's own gold solidus, and as we talked about in the political section, Charlemagne thinks of himself as being like the Romans. This is the rebirth of the Roman Empire. So one of the things that, of course, he has to do is mint a coin. And this is his version of a gold coin that looks a lot like the gold coin minted by Constantine. So he tries to mint coins. He, he tries to recreate this Roman economy, but in some sense, these broader arcs of movement that we talked about are stronger, and, and he doesn't have the core control, nor does he have broad enough, a broad enough economic foundation to recreate the economy that we see, certainly in the Roman Empire. But there are at least pretenses to minting new, reasonably fine, um, not debased gold coinage that people will use in trade. Um, but despite this, the majority of trade that continues to happen in Western Europe in the ninth century through the reign of Charlemagne continues to be trade in kind. And we will talk about what trade in kind looks like and what production, uh, a lot of these questions, particularly in the 10th century, we'll talk more about that next time. So for today, as we talked about with trade, there are three general views, the manorial, the mercantile, and the parenthesis, all of which had a different view of what is going on in Western Europe after the end of Rome. And the conflicts between those have largely been resolved by, by the work of Michael McCormick today with these, the movement of slaves, the elision between trading and raiding, and, and continued really continued broad movement of lots of people and lots of goods despite the end of Rome and despite the coming of Islam. So now let's take just a few minutes and we will look at production in this period. Um, and then we will be done. So I'm not going to spend that much time talking about production because almost the entirety of the next lecture discusses it. And I'll go into crop yields and different methods of growing grain, some of the agricultural technology at the time. We'll talk about it a bunch. So this time I just want to make a couple of points about agriculture in the wake of Roman decline. And as I mentioned with trade, a lot of this depends on what you think was going on in Rome at the time. If you think that, sure, there was a lot of trade, but really it didn't penetrate that far into rural areas, and that there were certain areas that were very market-oriented, but most areas were not connected to it, then probably not a lot changed. If you think that most people were doing some form of subsistence, that probably continues afterwards. Now, in Italy, certainly... Uh, there are lots of places that were market-oriented that become much more subsistence, that become at least more localized in their outlook through the 5th and 6th centuries. But as we were talking about on the more on the edges in northern France, um, England, parts of North Africa, agriculture already looks very, very diverse under Rome, so how much it actually changes 
in in the fifth and sixth centuries at the end of, of Roman centralized power? Probably not very much. You still need a very diverse set of technologies to be growing grain on the Scottish border as opposed to on the edge of the Sahara. And the technologies that are developed in those locations persist in those locations and aren't necessarily spread around by Roman connections anyway. Now, for Western Europe, one of the things that we talked about last time is the development of payment in kind, the granting of land to barbarian kings to have them protect the border, sets up this system of great estates that is going to exist for most of the medieval period in one way or another. Now, the traditional view is that the Carolingian rural economy is entirely dominated by rural estates. Uh, we now know, as we just talked about, that there, there was a lot more trade than was previously thought. People are moving around a lot more. It's not necessarily mon fully monetized trade, but there are goods flowing. And, but that doesn't negate the importance of these very large uh, land control systems that are developed. Now, the owners of these estates could be lords, what we tend to call feudal lords, but, but some form of nobility that has military control over a large amount of land. They can also be monasteries, and this, this picks up, particularly in the, the middle of the medieval period. When, if you remember, we talked about the development of Cluny. Cluny is given a giant endowment by a nobleman. That is land that is turned over to the church and is owned by that monastery, uh, essentially in perpetuity. So uh, they could be monasteries, uh, cathedrals tended to own large amounts of land, or they could be noblemen. And the thing about these lands is that they are not just a contiguous chunk. You don't necessarily own the area right around your castle. Um, you could have tracts of land that you got through inheritance or through contracts or other forms of exchange, um, gifts that could be very far away. There's a monastery in Paris that has lands up in the Alps, uh, hundreds of miles away, right? And, and the question is how often do they check on that land? What is their means of control over it? But they have a title, they have some claim to it. The monastery of Fulda, which is a, an imperial monastery, um, quite an important house, actually there's an excellent book on the house itself. Uh, they had almost 15,000 households on, on their various lands. So a huge amount of holdings. I mentioned before, small villages of a couple of hundred households. This is 15,000. Now it's scattered over a very wide area, but it's a huge land holding. Um, and monasteries in particular could amass very large land holdings because donations tended to go in one direction. They didn't tend to trade their lands out as much as they were given land. So they had a tendency to increase. That's not wholly true. They could trade them, move their lands around, and some of them were quite sophisticated in their dealing with that. But by and large, monasteries, particularly prestigious ones, tended to gain in size. Now, one persistent question about the character of these holdings is what was the level of freedom of the people doing the work? Uh, we mentioned that a lot of large holdings in Rome tended to be worked by slaves. Now, the nature of slavery changes with the end of Rome to the early medieval period. So you tend to get less prisoners captured in war doing all of the work on exchanges and the development of some form of tenant. Now, the, the tenants could be variously somewhat enslaved or somewhat free. They're referred to in Roman documents as, as colonae, colonica, sometimes as mansus. And mansus is, is one of the terms that becomes very popular in medieval Europe. They are semi-free, and while they are a tenant of the Lord, they can't necessarily sell their land. There are varying rights as to how tied you are to the land itself. Now, in some instances, this benefits the, the tenant themselves because the, they also have to remain with the land. The Lord can't simply sell the land and kick them off of it or move them to a new location they are part and parcel with it. So when lords sell lands, they're sometimes selling people along with that. This means that the people working in are not particularly free. This is what we tend to refer to as serfs. But they are also not straight up slaves that can be bought and sold independent of their families, independent of the land. And uh, 
this is a question that we will see that, that persists through the whole medieval period. How free are people doing rural labor? Uh, what is the difference between a peasant and a serf? Generally, we define peasants as more free than serfs. They have more rights, and those rights can consist of who they're allowed to marry, whether they need their lord's permission to marry, whether they need their lord's permission to sell some of their own land, what, what rights they have to alienation of property. Um, all of those are, are on something of a sliding scale that you already see developing in the early Carolingian period, where not everybody doing the work is slaves, but they're certainly not free. And, and we'll, we'll talk more about this in, in coming lectures in the class. What exactly does that mean? Um, suffice it to say that on the one hand, the, the view that Rome was simply an all-slave production society is probably inaccurate. There's a variety of different production styles at the end of Rome. But what large slave manners there are tend to convert over to some form of tendency over this period. Now, there's a debate in the 10th century that, again, we'll talk a little bit more about next time, as to whether or not all of a sudden many of the, the people who were slaves and were under slave forms of production were suddenly made peasants or more free. It now seems like it's more of a gradual shift. To some extent, this is my view of things. This also mirrors what one sees uh, and, and how I describe the end of Rome, right? There's, there's, there are large changes that occur, but they are gradual and they are not even across a large amount of space. That said, there are still slaves in the Carolingian economy. There are still, as we said, many of them are being traded out of Europe, but Europeans also own slaves at this point. There are still agricultural laborers who are themselves completely unfree and can be alienated from the land that they are on. That type of person is becoming more and more a minority, although it's possible that they were already a minority. So those are just a couple of notes about what production looks like. Uh, as I said, next time we will go into a lot of specifics about agricultural technology, crop yields, and the type of person doing the work. It'll be all focused on what is a what is a manner, what does the feudal system of production look like, how does this function as an economic system. So stay tuned for that next time.